talk about the many, many things that holography can be used for and the sorts of things that engineers are trying to do with holography and the sorts of things engineers need to know about holography. So I hope some of you managed to get to Augusto's talk uh, earlier this week. It was very, very good. Um, and we'll see what we're going to talk about today. The, the first thing I'd notice, note here just is if you look at the top uh, right-hand side of this, this was the actual International Year of Light. We, we, we hired lighting and we got funding and we lit up uh, a spire that's in the middle of Dublin. So we've got very active student chapters here in SPI and OSA. And in fact, uh, Brian Vonson, one of the attendees here, is going to be organizing uh, one of the IONS conferences here later in the year. And I hope some of you will have heard about this. And Brian is a Spanish speaker, so he's worth knowing. I'm afraid I, I only speak English and a little German. So this is my background. Uh, and I want to hopefully be able to do this with this. Um, I'm speaking to you from Ireland. I, I understand we have some people here from, from South America, and the university is based in Dublin, which you can see there on the right-hand side. I actually come from a part of Ireland in the West called Mayo, so I was very excited to find out that the Spanish word for the month of Mayo was Mayo. So this was very exciting for me. It's a very small country, Ireland, about 5 million people. I always find this amusing when I talk to people from China, where they have cities with twice and 10 times as many people. Uh, within UCD, we do quite a lot of different optics research. And I'm speaking here essentially about my group and the people within engineering. As you can see there on the top left-hand side, holography and polymers are one of the big things we do. But most of what we do actually is related back to holography in one shape or form. And that's mainly because my background, my PhD was in the area of holography with a man called Laszlo Solomar and, my, my, and also with another man called Colin Shepard on imaging microscopy. And before that, I'd spent some time at Georgia Tech with Professor Bill Rhodes, where I learned my Fourier optics. So I, there's kind of a mixture of different topics and themes here. Uh, all the way from Fourier optics to electromagnetic theory and materials. And I'm going to try and touch on that and, and sort of hopefully show you how this all ties in together with holography. Now, the books I'm going to be using, if you'd like, are the books that I would put your point you towards are shown here. One is by Richard Sims, who also came out of Laszlo Salomer's group in Oxford. Harvard Kogenig made a very major contribution in the area of periodic gratings. Uh, I studied in Georgia Tech also with a man called Thomas Gaylord, and he's very famous for his diffraction work, his diffraction theories. And more recently, there's been a book by a man called Raymond Kostuk, who comes out of Arizona. And Ray is a very nice guy, and his book, I think, is very, very good. So I recommend it to you. Most of the, the first three you can certainly get off the web if you're really interested. So why, why are we here, and, and why are we making noise? Well, I would trace it all the way back to, to Gabriel Lippmann and his uh, true color uh, photo photography, uh, the work of Braggs on finding out what happens inside crystals using X-rays, the patterns that the fraction patterns that X-rays form, all the way up to Dennis Gabor. And Augusto did an excellent background and historical note on this. And if you didn't get to his talk, I'd say try and get your hands on the video for that. And the, the, as goes to a show, essentially, uh, Gabor came up with his work. He was trying to improve the performance of microscope, uh, and specifically X-ray microscope, electron microscope, excuse me. But it was Denizuk and Lethe Nyuputnik who, using combinations of lasers and off-axis geometries, actually showed how interesting or how practical uh, Dennis Gabor's idea was. And I think it was fair to say that Gabor and most of the community wouldn't have quite given up on the idea of holography, but certainly the application that was proposed for it. And 10 years after the work of Dennis Zook on reflection gratings and Leith and Yuputnik on transmission gratings, Gabor got his Nobel Prize, and he himself mentioned the, the, the contributions of the other authors. And I suppose the, the point I would be trying to make today is how much holography has influenced me and excited me and over the years. I should also mention that one of the reasons I'm interested in holography is because a, a Professor Baez came to visit my university on the west of Ireland uh, when I was a young guy in my 20s, back in the 80s, and he gave a really lovely talk. And at the time, of course, these were very interesting ideas. Lasers and holograms were very interesting ideas anyways.
But certainly Professor Bayer's talk really intrigued me. So why are we here? Why is this such a wonderful thing? Why are we interested in it? Well, we did a roadmap on holography for the Journal of the Optics uh, for IOP in 2020. And you can see I was joined there by Ray Costello, kind of terrible guy called Antonio Femia. And everything that's wrong here is his fault, okay? That's that's just goes without saying. But we've got basically about uh, 30 contributors from 30 universities, uh, ranging all the way from uh, digital holography, metrology, materials, computing, data storage, art. Uh, it's really quite remarkable. And every five or 10 years, holography kind of bubbles up to the top again, uh, was optical computing, holographic data storage, because it's a really powerful or robust uh, principle. And it leads on to, and it matches up with a huge number of other principles out there. Now, there's no way that even this uh, issue contains 10% of the type of work that's been doing around, or doing, being done all around the world. And there's going to be a, a series of things that are going to emerge from this two years. There's going to be a whole lot of special issues and conferences. And I would certainly recommend everybody out there in this area, your students, your colleagues, they, they will have many opportunities to present and to publish over the next couple of years. And I would really, really strongly advise them to do so. And if you have any questions, please contact myself or contact Immaculata, and we'll be able to help you with that if we can at all. So why as an engineer am I interested in these things? Well, some of these, and many of you are experts, so you know this type of uh, spiel fairly well. But I just note up that many automobiles now have head-up displays, off-axis mirrors, selective, wavelength selective off-axis mirrors. People are using holograms and diffraction gratings, various shapes and forms for angular and polarization, multiplexing and demultiplexing. And even in the, the things like fiber brag gratings, where you have gratings formed by interference patterns inside optical fibers. And then very, very hot at the moment is the idea of virtual reality, augmented reality, mixed reality, where people want to build glasses or even contact lenses that you can wear, which will allow you to view uh, either in full immersion or superimposed upon things around you, virtual reality. There's a big push, there's a lot of money. And these people are trying to use compact components, including holographic optical elements that have many, many functions, mixtures of the functions that are shown here. So people want to be able to design and mass produce these components. We all know about holographic lenses where we record and we replay. These are words you're going to hear over again. This idea of strange patterns and multiple lenses, off-axis and on-axis lenses and the aberrations that arise and that are associated with these things and defects inside materials. And I hopefully mention materials a bit later as well. Things like beam splitters here and, and sensors, biosensors, optical sensors, devices for manipulating light to produce, for example, here we've got a, a multiple beam splitters and also stable interference patterns. And things like permutation. So, for example, when optical computing was, was big, people wanted to be able to see could they actually combine lots of these types of components, micro lenses or diffraction grids to produce permutation, shuffle and permutation elements. Another very hot topic at the moment is digital holography. Now, I'm not going to talk at, at length about any specific area, but I want to give you a bit of an overview and then hopefully want to come back and look at some of the theories that people use for these things. So, and in line and out of offline a digital holographic system, this, uh, this is an online one. We actually did this in collaboration with Intel. And the idea was to use computational, Im computational imaging, image processing techniques, which is a big thing at the moment to basically compensate for, correct for, or extract information from light fields. And the idea was to build a very simple system, as simple as possible, where you could in both measure objects, which were quite small. We've got little balls here, which are 10 microns, and actually image over a large depth of field. So we could have planes of these balls that are 10 microns separated by up to a, a millimeter or more. And we could use a single wavelength and extract out information about them or multiple wavelengths and extract even more information out about them. And this usually requires some sort of processing. And the processing is actually often iterative. And we go to somebody like Jim uh, Saxton and Gershberg or Finup, and they have developed iterative techniques for extracting out phase from intensity information. You, you capture one intensity, or you capture multiple intensities separated by 
position or perhaps by different wavelengths. And using this, you can extract out in an indirect fashion the phase of a field, and you can therefore reconstruct the full three-dimensional field and therefore basically get the holographic type information. And you can use a similar process for designing diffractive optical elements, for example, surface relief diffractive optical elements. And I've worked on making these holographic optical elements I've shown of, and I've also worked on building and extracting out phase information using these holographic principles. And in fact, the inline geometry, the inline holographic by images on top of one another. And digital holography, we can go all the way back to the original work by, by uh, Joe Goodman, who actually captured holographic type information using a, using a camera back in the 60s. So all of these very general ideas, they, they have repercussions. They echo, if you'd like, all the way through optics. Uh, now we're capturing digital holograms using terahertz waves. So the, you don't have a nice little beam. You have the equivalent of like an invisible an, an antenna, that big upper lump of metal sticking out into that box. Exactly the antenna, the source electromagnetic radiation, and the wavelength is a millimeter. But we can go away and we can capture holographic information and we can extract out full 3D information. And the fact that the resolution of the image is of the order of a millimeter is if like neither here nor there. We can go away and we can extract this information. There's a whole range of signal processing and algorithmic approaches to actually extract out this phase information. All this comes from holography. All this comes from Gabor at the end of the day. I mentioned surface relief gratings and the design of surface relief gratings. And one of the people that uh, Augusto mentioned was uh, Adolf Lohmann in Erlangen, who I had the great privilege of, of, of interacting with and, and working with and on, studying under. And of course, he came away with these, these ideas again, tied in again with Saxon Gershberg of capturing intensities at different planes, extracting out the full field information and being able to generate these holograms, which basically could produce varying intensity distributions, either very functional, as we saw up here, which would be a, a computer generated hologram to produce an array of bright spots or artistic, where, for example, you buy your laser pointer and you shine the light through your surface relief pattern and you get yourself a, the Fourier transform in the field far away on the wall. You see your pattern. And again, often these things rely on search algorithms, design algorithms. So you're actually talking about the application of iterative techniques to design these elements. And of course, then this goes from your volume type elements to surface patterned and binary type patterned diffraction gratings. And again, these are the ideas, these are the things that engineers will be trying to design using optimization tools, using electromagnetic theory, and using these numerical search patterns. And again, it depends how far away from the object you want to observe these things, whether they're purely functional or whether there's something more complicated. So multiple use elements and computer generated holograms. And of course, nowadays, it's not even beyond that to measure surfaces. Once you've actually got things or you talk about something which is fixed in a surface, you can also go away and start looking at spatial light modulators. And again, we've looked at these types of, of devices for modulating light, for producing images or diffraction patterns, and using modulation of amplitude or phase or polarization to actually produce the results you want, whether that's a functional operation or a display type operation or whether you're using this, for example, as the input to a data storage device, a recording medium. And once you actually start talking about all of these possibilities that you can modulate the light in all these different ways, you can start talking about introducing things like optical watermarking or optical encryption and inquire to nonlinear and asymmetric type encryption devices and systems. So again, you're manipulating the full field, the full holographic data in order to make sure that your information is secure. And again, these are all things which basically, as I said, I, 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 I take an ideas from holography and apply these ideas and ideas from diffraction theory and, and volume scattering and information processing. And at the root, as I said, is all this inspiration which came from, to a large extent, from Gabor and the work of Gabor, then Leith, Yuputnik and Denisuk. So, of course, what the students like to do is they like to have nice colored pictures and make some nice colored pictures. And here would be a, one of our benches and we record holograms at different uh, wavelengths. And of course, this is a storage type application. I'll talk maybe a little bit about storage later, but essentially you're making some sort of a record in a material. And so materials become very, very important. Uh, I've worked with a lot of different types of materials, and I have to tell you up front, I'm not a materials person. I don't enjoy doing chemistry or talking about chemistry. I much prefer differential equations. 
I'm one of the sad people who came to optics because they liked electromagnetic theory, not because they liked photography. But this art, his art storage and recovery of information, whatever the form, is a fundamental application of holography. And again, uh, Gusto talked about this very much and Gabor's belief in the data storage capability of uh, the holographic principle. And the idea that the limits are technical, they're actually to do with materials, they're to do with writing devices and reading devices. And as these things get better and better, of course, you're, you're competing with other technologies that are also getting better, like magnetic tape. But holography has some very, very special and unique characteristics, which mean that it has this capability, which ultimately, almost certainly will lead to it being used as some sort of an archival storage methodology. Okay, so let's talk about a simple introduction to holography. And, and Gusto gave us a very introduction the last day, and I'm going to kind of speed through this a little bit. But again, I want to emphasize a couple of points that I hope will help later on in the talk. So this is the sorts of notes I give to my students. The idea that a photograph is an image through a pinhole, and a hologram is an image through an actual window, so you can move your head side to side. And then this idea that you've captured this depth information, which is associated with phase. Okay, so you've got this whole, all of the information about the object. And of course, if it's color, you've also got the color type information in the natural scene. And this idea that we have these multiple steps, we have this interference exposure step where we've got a recording. And then we have a medium which reacts to this exposing intensity. And then we have a reconstruction stage. So we have an object and a reference field on so recording. And then we have replay and production of a virtual image. And there's this gap sometimes between the photograph or the image and the actual gray things, which we talk about a lot in terms of practical uh, applications. But again, this is quite important. And for the engineers, we often talk about Fourier spectra and the idea that we've got this uh, recording which has these Fourier spectra and that we can then extract information out from the spectrum that we have recorded. So we have a record geometry here. We have the object beam illuminating this object. The light comes off. We've got a reference beam. We record an interference pattern. And they have some material. And that, that the photosensitive material then becomes one of the big objects. Or we have a camera then. The camera then is recording the intensity. And of course, you have to talk to people about the fact that, well, the interference pattern is actually the interaction of the light with the measurement device, it's not really the, the you know, we, we're, we don't actually have no photons, but there's a dark band, which is of the E fields opposing one another. You can tell people a lot of interesting things. So again, here's our object field and recording field, and you can go through and you can write out some mathematics at the bottom of that page. You can see your instant field, and you can see your interference, the magnitude squared. So you have this idea of a multiplicative type effect because you're, you're not dealing with the of the fields. And then you have yourself an encoding, an encryption, where you're carrying this object information into the interference pattern, which you're recording. And then typically we wave our hands and say we have a nice linear material. And so we simply multiply that intensity by some sort of a constant. And we say, well, that's what we've got inside the material. It's a lovely way to explain it, I think. And then we replay it with a beam, maybe with the same spatial frequency as the reference beam. And we come up with this complicated looking U trans described before. So we have an amplitude transmittance function, or maybe, and we typically describe it in that way because it's the easiest way to approach it. And then we replay our grating, we just multiply this transmittance function by the input field that we're playing with. And then lo and behold, we've got the third term there in red, and that basically is the original field from the object. So abracadabra, we've pulled this out of the, the hat, and, and this is the magic. And it really is the magic. I tell all my students that I like to spend one day a year not believing in holography. Because the belief isn't the right thing to do here. You go back and you look at it and you say, well, this is a very neat and tidy way, a very plausible version of what's happening. Yeah, of course, things get more complicated. We all know that it's much more complicated than this, but it's incredibly plausible. And it basically illustrates the holographic principle in a lovely way. It also shows the effects of these other terms, these higher order terms that are going that messed up, if you'd like, Gabor's experiment, made it a bit dirty. And it illustrates why the contributions of Lee Kuputnik and Denisuk are so important, where they went to a single wavelength, a single frequency, where they went to a long coherence, where they could get a very crisp interference pattern and a very at a single wavelength. It also makes more extraordinary the work of Littmann, I think, and how his, how his photography worked. So we have our replay, 
And here we show our virtual image. We've got our beam coming into this material and we've got our viewer. And again, we can separate out, spatially separate out all these higher order beams, the transmitted function, and we can separate out our nice observer and we can see the effects of spatial frequency. And when we talk later about things like optical signal processing or our, in our courses or spectrum analysis or an understanding of spatial frequency, that we have one over with angles, with wavelengths. So we have units of one over meter and it's for engineers, it's like Hertz, which is one over seconds. And hopefully they can latch onto that and understand what's happening. We then generally tell them, and we record ourselves, that we have these different geometries. We have the transmission geometry and we have reflection geometry. And we can record how we record both of them and how we replay both of them and the terminology associated with that. This is quite important, I think. And the importance of the contribution somewhat minimizes what people do, but everything, of course, is deeper and more complicated. But to get the big core ideas over, and that we don't just have unslanted gratings, we have slanted gratings. Slant, unslanted gratings have a special piece in our, in our heart because, of course, if we've unslanted transmission gratings and we have shrinking and swelling, then actually that there's no tilt in our fringes, so we don't have to worry about things happening in terms of our replay angle. So we have our geometries and we have these things called evil diagrams. So we show our exposure. And what we generate is a grating. We record our intensity pattern. And if we've got simple plane waves in our exposing beams, then we have a sinusoidal interference pattern. And that has a period. And that one over that period is going to give us something about the spatial frequency of that grating. And we use our evil diagram in phase space. Again, we've moved to this one over meter space indicating directions of beams. And the K vector is permanent. So we can change, when we replay, we can replay at different angles or with different wavelengths, but the grating is fixed. We've recorded it and some, we fixed it in some way. So this is all terminology and ideas that will come up later as I go forward. And of course, Benton made a major contribution, essentially recording through a slit and therefore producing this lovely colorful rainbow type approach, which is very attractive to people. And again, leads to all our credit cards and a security uh, a method of applying security to these methods. And there's lots of stories about how people have managed to fake all various types of security uh, um, uh, things on currencies, but holography has been quite robust simply because it's, it's difficult to do well. Now, some more terminology I'm going to need because I'm going to talk a little bit about diffraction and I want to make sure everybody knows about these things. I'm sure most of you do and I apologize for those. I'm hopefully not talking down to you, but I want to give a sort of a rounded picture to what's happened and, and maybe also tell you the way I look at things. So we have our plane waves, these lovely things that are the same everywhere. I, I often have discussions with students about this, engineering students, about the so many things go on to plus and minus infinity. And I assure them that, well, if they're happy to use sines and cosines for the currents and their voltages, the sines and cosines also go on to plus and minus infinity. But we have this nice breakdown in terms of the wave vectors, the directionality information. And we we'll use this, for example, in this idea of spatial frequency and the optical Fourier transform effect of a lens, the idea that these plane waves we can imagine lumping all the power into a single, a single delta function at a particular angular or spatial frequency uh, point. That we can interfere these two things and we get our nice little interference pattern, which gives us a period and it's intimately linked to the angle between the beams, etc. And we link this then into the physical interference pattern and the physical thing, the transmittance function, if, if you'd like, that we get inside the material. So all this is very nice standard stuff, but again, if you know it, it's really cool. And if you don't know it, it can be very confusing for people. So we come back as an engineer and we say, well, you know, we want to be able to manufacture things like these mirrors. And the other thing we want to do, so besides fabricating and making things, we want to characterize materials. This becomes very, very important because as I said to you, you know, often with Maxwell or with, with uh, Gabor, the holographic principle, it all looks lovely. It all looks very nice and plausible and easy. And then, unfortunately, you've got to go and try and make things. And then things tend to get a bit more difficult. Now, we're very lucky nowadays uh, in some ways. I remember I was very happy going into dark rooms and playing around with chemicals in dark rooms, even though probably the chemicals had a very bad effect on me. But we're very lucky nowadays because we have self-processing materials. We can expose materials and make gratings and basically the material processes itself. So things are a lot easier than they used to be, certainly when people had to make their own layers using things like dichromated gelatin. Buying things like silver halide from Agfa or from Kodak, etc. 
but we want to be able to fabricate, but we also want to be able to characterize our material, the performance of our material, and we want to be able to improve the material. This is where things like chemistry come in, composition of material to try and make it work better. And this will be a typical type of system where we're recording and we're also probing at the same time. And perhaps we're also changing the angle of the plate, the recorded hologram with respect to the incoming beams. So we talk about on-brag replay and off-brag replay and characterization. Once we've actually made our grating, and, and this is something I'm going to concentrate a little bit on, we've got this notion of diffraction, measuring the diffraction efficiency. And I remember with great fondness, uh, and my former supervisor, Bill Rhodes, uh, who now spends part of every year in, in Colombia, uh, talking about this and explaining to me that, well, everybody was quite happy with refraction, and most people were happy with reflection because they had mirrors, and they were quite willing to accept an idea like interference, so that you could add two things in phase, and, and it got stronger and out of phase, and they cancelled. But people were, in general, not very happy with the idea of diffraction. And what he said to me basically, well, the fraction is everything else. And usually it's a mixture of the three above. And that's always helped me when I try to tackle these problems. And, you know, again, Augusto mentioned Jung and Frendel and Kirchhoff and all these brilliant guys and the way they went. And it's very interesting to see the historical context of how they came to these problems and the big problems in their day, the big controversies. Is it a particle? Is it a wave? How do I actually deal with this? And also the drivers behind these things, why they were trying to do what they were doing. Because in general, a lot of these guys weren't just doing it for fun. They had actual reasons. They wanted to look at the stars. Yeah, They wanted to build microscopes that were better. In any case, we we're going to look at how these volume gratings scatter light. We assume we made them, and I mentioned that we're going to come back and talk about the materials, but it turns out we have to figure out how they actually scatter light before we can go back and look at the material. And there's a couple of things that we are very well uh, known and that people use all the time. One is the idea of diffraction orders and the, the, the grating equation, which is a core thing and is related to things like conservation momentum. And we can represent diffraction in different ways here. We've got this idea of we, we constructive interference of the rays coming off this periodic pattern. We can write as diffraction orders or a power spectrum. And we can also represent it on this evil diagram, which I talked about previously, which turns out to be a very useful way to describe these things. Of course, the diffraction grating, the grating equation has been tested down to very, very highly accurate. But essentially, it doesn't tell you anything about the amount of light. It simply tells you the particular pathways in which light are going to go. Another thing we need to know about is the Bragg condition, this idea of there's particular directions, particular output diffraction orders, which can have a lot of light. And basically, because not only are there scattering along one dimension and X, but there's also scattering inside a volume of an object, so you have planes. And of course, this would be very important for people looking at thick crystals. And this is much closer to the sort of effect that we're going to be interested in when we talk about um, um, holographic gratings. We typically will have a pattern, at, a period pattern on the boundaries. But now we're talking about some depth, that there's patterns inside the depth. And again, what we see is it's completely compatible with a grating equation. But we see that there are particular angles of replay, particular wavelengths of replay, given a periodic structure. We have this possibility of construction of scattered light from different various steps inside. And we've got our EVA diagram again. We've shown our capital K, our grating vector there. It's a slanted grating. We've got our input beam and we've got the green diffractive beam there. And again, this is in phase space. And again, just a note here that if we look at a pair of particular interference pattern, which results from a particular wavelength and angle, we can go away and take that interference pattern, that grating, and we can re we can change the wavelength of replay or the angle of replay, and we can we can stay on brag. So the re recording conditions set up the actual grating. Once we have the grating, we can then change our replay conditions. And some of those replay conditions, if we change our angle and wavelength appropriately, will be on brag for that grating. Again, we don't really know anything about the amount of light scattered, but we have some ideas about where the light's going to travel. Now, a very brief one here on nomenclature. I just want to stuck this up here because, again, it shows a little bit about the breadth of holography. We're talking about volume gratings, multiple scatterers, and you can have thick surface relief gratings, you can have holograms, you can have in waveguides, acoustic optics. There's a lot of people doing lots of work with book by Stanford. Uh, dynamical X ray scatter, electron, neutron scatter, solid state, the description of the bands inside a, a, a solid state material are essentially arise because of Bragg effects of the wave, the wave interference. You know, they can be linked very closely to holographic ideas that arise in holography. 
We have the idea of thick and thin gradients, which I'll talk a little bit about later. But again, multiple scatter versus single scatter. We've got different geometries, including intermediate geometries. We are not just a simple reflection or transmission. And you can have finite gratings. And of course, what's modulating the material, the exposing pattern changes something inside the material. It can change many things. It can change the real part and the imaginary part or some mixture of the permittivity inside that material. What optics we talk about refractive and it's real imaginary. Conduct, uh, engineers would talk about intrinsic impedance and things like this. So we have a whole load of different types of characteristics associated with a single type of hologram. And most of us, most of the time, we tend to talk about on and off Bragg replay. We tend to talk about lossless gratings because lossy gratings, you lose light. Uh, and we tend to talk about things that are planar. So thin, relatively thin layers. So people can now make materials which 20, 30 microns thick can be used for things like panchromatic recording. They're very stable over a wide range of materials. Not, they're not stable for all temperatures, for example, but they're quite stable over a long period of time. Okay, so we're looking at, and a lot of what I'm gonna do is gonna be couched in terms of this idea of the perfect sinusoidal grating, because I, as an engineer, we often talk about the frequency response of materials or systems, okay? And we often talk about, and we typically concentrate on things like T polarization, and we talk about linearly polarized light. So there's a whole sort of assumptions that come up when you talk about these models, but there's a huge literature out there where people have looked at much more complicated type situations than I'm going to talk about here. So we've said where the light's going. That's like budget. Where's the light going? Great. But how much? Okay. And to do that, we often split down a whole series of models. And choosing between the models, what we're typically trying to do is we're trying to use the simplest model because typically that's faster. It gives more physical insight. And on the other hand, we're going to be probably characterizing that against experimental results, but also more complicated models. So we've got our scale, our simple single scatter type models, and essentially the description I gave of holography above, above which was based on say, the transmittance function, that would be a very simple single scatter type model. Intermediate models would be something like the coconut type model, which I mentioned earlier, where basically you say, well, I, I assume I only need to retain a certain number of waves. If I talk about sinusoidal grating and plane wave, I only need a certain number of plane waves and coconut specifically concentration on two waves. Or I need something more complicated. I need to go up to Maxwell's theory. Now I'm going to talk a little bit about cover wave theory because it leads on very naturally from Kogelnik's type description. But people have a finite time difference to look at these things and finite gratings, etc. And again, if somebody has some questions, I'm very happy to point them in the direction. If you do surface relief gratings, computer generated holograms, you pretty much are stuck using Maxwell's theory unless you've got very, very big periods or very shallow gratings. Here's a figure that I've got from a paper by Tom Gaylord. Uh, for me, this is a really nice description. We're going to be starting down there at the bottom on amplitude to transmittance theory. We're going to go up to Kogan's two wave, and then we're going to jump up to the rigorous copper wave theory. Now, there are many ways to describe what happens inside these materials. I've already mentioned these finite time domain or uh, finite element methods. Um, the regular the modal methods, instead of assuming you have plane waves inside the periodic structure, you actually go away and find the modes that exist inside the structure. These things are in general equivalent. If you could keep an infinite number of plane waves, infinite number of modes, you would get exactly the same answer. But of course, in particular situations, you basically get faster convergence in some methods than others. And numerically, it typically boils down to convergence, stability. So our transmittance theory, which we used previously, typically revolves around the idea of having a period of the grating, which is bigger than the wavelength, typically much bigger. So you're going to get a lot of diffraction orders. You've got a component to the grating vector, which is much less than beta, beta being the, the wave vector, is the magnitude wave vector associated with the plane wave. And you can go all the way back to ideas from Fraunhofer and Fresnel, where you've got a rectangular window. You've got the output field divided by the input field gives you that transmittance function. You describe the transmittance function as some sort of a Fourier series, or capital KX there, the T of X. We can see these things that have particular amplitudes. And then if we've got an input field, we multiply the input field by this transmittance function, and we find our output field. It's very nice. It's very tidy. And we want to use this every time. Yeah, I mean, simple is good. Okay, simple is fast, simple is good, gives physical insight. And if we're going to use some sort of a numerical routine for searching for things, this is a good place to start. Yeah, it may be highly inaccurate, especially as the period gets smaller, but it's a good place to start. And we can look at things like, like our Fraunhofer diffraction regime, what's going to happen in the far field, that we get a Fourier transform of the field coming out of that aperture, for example, and we're going to see some diffraction patterns in the far field. 
And we can come along and do the classic calculation where we think we have a 10 amplitude modulation or a 10 phase grade modulation. And again, this is very good for engineers because they're used to optical signal processing where the amplitude modulation and frequency modulation or phase modulation. And so you get the same type of mathematical results, except you have functions which maybe are a function of X and Y instead of being a function of time. And here's our classic diffraction pattern in the far field, for example, for a phase grating. And we've got our diffraction efficiencies that are going to be proportional to the vessel functions uh, with for particular thicknesses. And we can link this all together. So for the first time, we not only know the directions of the light, we also have some expressions giving us an indication of the phase of the light. And again, I've used these expressions to analyze, for example, large period surface relief gratings on the surface of, of volume holograms because you have some shrinking and swelling, for example. And this is the sort of theory you would use in that case where you've got a surface relief pattern with a relatively weak type modulation of the phase. Now, volume holograms are a little bit different because we have this Bragg condition. There's no Bragg condition with those 10 gratings that we've just described. If you change the angle of the wavelength of replay, you get pretty much the same answer. Okay. It turns out, if you do follow the rigorous electromagnetic theory, if you look at the coupled equations governing this type of situation, you essentially have no off brag in those equations. Volume gratings are more complicated. You've got thick gratings, you've got multiple scatter, dynamical scatter. There's a lot of different words coming from different areas. So now we've moved up to the second box, the Koenig two-wave coupled wave theory box here. And just to illustrate here, at the top, you've got yourself a typical type of diagram of a thin grating where you've got a beam coming in and lots of diffraction orders separated by small angles. And typically the power is going to be spread out between those diffraction orders. Whereas your thick grating is down below and you basically have two diffraction orders. You've got a period which is small and the power will be between those two orders. Okay. And if you actually go away and you look at the type of variation, if you can imagine having a thin grating and uh, increasing the modulation, you would see that blue curve, that vessel type curve down below. So your diffraction efficiency would increase up to a maximum, which would be less than about 40% and then would decrease. Whereas for your thick grating, you can go all the way, that red curve, you can right go, theoretically go all the way up to 100% diffraction efficiency. So thin gratings, lots of diffraction orders, maximum diffraction efficiency about uh, 40%, thick gratings, you go all the way up to 100%. And uh, a set of papers came out where people came away and they examined, I think Gerard was one of the people who made major contributions here, and they came up with this idea that they could split up the gratings under a set of probably actual physical thickness, the modulation, etc. And using these, they could find two parameters and they could map out space so that they could say, well, if you have a particular lump parameter that falls below the curve there shown on the left, you've got a, a, a Raman nath or a thin grating. So of course, Raman and nath would have done a lot of work on diffraction by acoustic waves, and these would have been large period. They would have been uh, governed by the Bessel type functions. Whereas on the right hand side, you've got your Bragg regime, this two wave type regime. And if you sometimes you may have seen this curve where they actually plot the log of the parameter on the vertical versus the log of the parameter on the, on the horizontal, and you actually get something which looks like a cross, two lines that simply cross somewhere in the middle. So again, we have our interference of our plane waves. We've added the two plane waves together. We've multiplied it by its complex conjugate, the total field. And we've got a period, an interference pattern. We've recorded our grating, so we've got a layer of material which is placed inside the interference pattern, and we can describe our exposing intensity, and we can describe the characteristic of the material, and all again we've assumed here is that we multiply that exposing intensity, and we take the exposing intensity, we multiply by time, so we have a dose, an energy dose at a point inside the volume, and then we multiply by some parameter, we've got a linear response to the material, and abracadabra, we've got our grating, we've got our refractive index modulation, typically a density modulation. And we've got, just to remind ourselves that we've got this interference pattern. This is the unslanted case, but actually what we've got is something inside of volume. It looks like fringes. It looks a little bit like a Venetian blend. Now, Bragg, again, we have a Bragg condition. We have our evil diagram in phase space. And again, the unslanted case, we've got our two input beams. We've got our K grating, which is then recorded. And the K is the thing that's permanent. And then we can change the input angle and wavelength to replay that. And we can find out whether we're on Bragg, whether we have this vector closure condition, where we can see that the row one touches the circle, which of course it must, because the width of that circle is related to one over the wavelength. And we've got our K coming down, and if our diffracted order touches that circle, we've obeyed our flow K condition, as it's referred to. We've got K vector closure. 
Here we show a fixed grating. And what we've done here is that in the middle, we've got our on-brag wavelength, on-brag angle. And we've changed our wavelength either side. We're using a bigger, uh, a smaller wavelength. And as the wavelength decreases, the EVA diagram gets bigger. So on the right-hand diagram, we're actually replaying with a smaller wavelength. And on the left-hand side of that diagram, we're replaying with a, we're assuming we have a bigger wavelength. And what we can say is that by changing our angle, if we change the wavelength and the angle, we can still get this k-vector closure. But we can see on the far left that based in that case, the k, the k for the grating, is actually so big that there's probably no condition we can meet here where we're going to actually get a diffraction order. We're going to get diffraction if we're going to be able to obey that Bragg condition. We're always going to be off Bragg. And similarly here, we've got a situation where we keep the wavelength the same, but we change the replay angle. And what we see is that we move away. We change it. And, and what we end up with is we cannot close the actual the vector. We cannot close the triangle. And these conditions, the one in the middle is on Bragg. And the other cases, we've changed our angle, increased or decreased our angle to such an extent that basically we're far off Bragg. We cannot close the vector. So our Bragg vector, with the Bragg condition is not met. And what that typically means is we're not going to get a lot of diffraction order. On Bragg, we will get an appreciable diffraction order. Typically, if we play off Bragg, we will not get appreciable diffraction order. So we come back again to our model here. Okay, and we say we're going to do Kogelnik. And so very quickly, we start off with Max's wonderful equations, and we assume things are material, and we assume we have something maybe lossless and has no magnetic effects. And so it all boils down to a much simplified Helmholtz type equation, and maybe it's, again, we don't have to worry too much about it being three dimensional. And we make a substitution in, we assume we have a variation of our permittivity. So we've done our exposure, we've done our recording, we've got a mod cosinusoidal modulation of our permittivity and of our conductivity. We substitute this into our Helmholtz type equation. And again, we can characterize this in terms of modulation if we're in the optical domain or an amplitude modulation. And often we're going to assume that the alphas here, the conductivity is zero and the alphas are zero. We can't always do that. And then we assume that we can express the field inside the volume. Yeah. So now we're replaying our hologram. We've got a sinusoidal variation. We're putting a light beam plane wave in. We're replaying with, let's say, the reference beam. And what we're going to do is we're going to assume that our field can be described in the following way up here. We've got a component R associated with the direction for the input beam. And we've got an S associated with the direction with the object beam, these two plane waves. And what we're essentially doing here is we're saying, well, we know the plane waves aren't modes. So the, 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 the plane waves will not propagate just through this material and only accumulate phase. They're going to be scattered. And so what we do is we perturb the amplitudes of these plane waves. So the R is a function of Z and the S is a function of Z. And we assume yeah, that our diffraction order, the sigma there, is equal to rho minus k. We might not be closing the triangle, but we can use this flow k condition to relate the wave vectors inside the volume. Okay, And if we do that, we can substitute this expression into our coupled equations, and we can simplify them. We assume, for example, that we have no effects at the boundaries. We've got very weak coupling, and we boil down to the two the two sets of equations, two first order coupled equations shown there on the right hand side of that diagram. And on Bragg, we have our on a Bragg parameter equal to zero. So it further simplifies process of assumptions. And again, we're trying to find the diffraction intensity. Yeah. We know the direction. We know we have a, a situation where we don't, we have only two beams. We've got a thick grating, so we can't just assume we've got lots of diffraction orders. And if we do that, we assume essentially we've got a bulk of material which is stuck there in the middle. We've got a Z is equal to zero and a Z is equal to D. We've got some field coming into this. The grating fills all of space. We started off propagating at Z is equal to Z. The power in those two beams are going to be coupled back and forth. And then at some point, Z is equal to D we're basically going to be able to calculate, or can we calculate out our R at Z is equal to D and our S is Z is equal to D, which are going to be associated with our transmission and refracted light. This is essentially what we, we've dumped our second order derivatives. We've got a slow variation of the radiation, the coupling between the two, and we want to find out what's coming out. We can go away and we can find expressions for the R and the S. It's a bit tricky, and we can find an expression for the diffraction order. In terms of our experimental result, we're quite interested in on Bragg replay because, for example, we want to see how this grating is diffracting light as, for example, it's being formed during our exposure. If we're characterizing the material, we're trying to measure this diffraction efficiency and it's going to be a function of time. So we're exposing and measuring diffraction at the same time. 
And in the simple case where we're playing on Bragg, we've got this nice expression for the field of the diffractive beam, which is equal to sine kappa d, where kappa is related to the actual uh, modulation, strength of the modulation, the thickness and the angles in the place. And we've got a diffraction efficiency, which is sine squared of nu, again, kappa d. And we can do the same thing for transmission or reflection gratings, and we can plot out the actual values of the or the magnitude of R of Z and S of Z inside the layer. And we can look at transmission geometry. We have initial conditions that R is equal to X equal to zero and X equal to zero or Z is equal to zero. So we have an input beam, which is one, and at the input surface, the refractive beam is a value of zero. And we can go away then, and we can calculate how, what the value of R and S are when we've got X equal to D or Z is equal to D. In the reflection geometry, you can see it's different, the amplitudes. In this case, the input is at uh, Z, or is X is equal to zero, it's one. But now we know that our factor beam has a value of zero at the far side, the other side of the plate. And so we have mixed boundary conditions. But again, we can solve this to find out what's reflected from this uh, grating. And we can write down this simplified form or more condensed form where we have an unslanted grating, we have a grating vector, 2 pi over the period of the grating. We have a modulation of the refractive index. We've got our capital K there, which is our grating vector. And we've got a non bragg diffraction efficiency, which is the diffracted efficiency divided by the input intensity, which is related to sine squared nu. And we see that nu there is the modulation N1, the amplitude modulation, the refractive index modulation times D, divided by the Bragg wavelength times the cosine of the Bragg angle. Now, typically, experimentally, we're not really, we don't really use the diffraction efficiency. We tend to use diffraction selectivity, which is the output diffracted light divided by the output diffracted light plus the output transmitted light. And this would be particularly handy for the transmission geometry case. And again, we have this characteristic of a thick grating and a thin grating. And what I note there in the bottom left-hand side is we have this idea of the characteristic as we make the thick grating thinner. So basically we change, we're change. we keeping the wavelength the same, we've got a fixed grating, we change our replay angle. We're basically going to see that we get this sinusoid sink-like behavior, sine x over x. We've got a maximum value on Bragg, and then it decreases as we move away, as we move off Bragg and angle, and we get this side lobe type structure. And this, of course, assumes we've got some sort of a uniform grating. We may have variation of the modulation with depth. So up here we've got this idea that the modulation is the same at every point in Z, but the modulation may not be constant in Z. It may vary with Z, for example, due to absorption during the exposure regime. And if we go, if we look at these ideas of thin, intermediate, or thick, and we look at our off brag response, so as we change the replay angle, we typically move something from a very thin grating on the top down to a very thick sink like uh, sign sink type behavior as we move off Bragg here. And we see that this for an unstandard transmission grating, as we move to plus and minus P to B, so we have two input beams, and we're going to have on Bragg responses at both the object and the reference beam. Okay, so we've had our scalar type model, our covalent type model. What's left is our rigorous EMAG model. And again, we start off with our, uh, and again, what we're trying to do here is we're trying to find out how much light is scattered, the quantity of light that's scattered, because we want to make things. We want to make things like our, our virtual reality headset, for example. Uh, in this case, we're going to have multiple, potentially multiple different uh, beam waves inside. So we use a multiple plane waves inside the volume to describe the field, and we may have multiple waves outside. We can still have a thick grating. Uh, we could have a, a relatively large period along the boundary with many diffraction orders, so two, three, four, five, six, etc. But we're going to assume we have a Bragg condition, so probably most of the light is going to be the zeroth order and the Bragg traveling outwards at the Bragg angle. And in this case, we expand up. We have to go out and we have, again, a simple cosine slider variation of our permittivity, but now we've got a whole lot of diffraction orders. So again, we note here just in this diagram that we may have different average refractive indices on both sides of the layer. So for example, we may have a polymer on top of layer, or plastic, if you like, on top of a layer of glass. And so we will have different effective wavelengths in the different media, and therefore our evil diagnosis may have different radii, outside and inside. In any case, we basically end up with 
a second order couple of differential equations. And once again, we assume that we can neglect second order derivatives. There's slow coupling. Their boundary conditions may or may not be important. In that case, we can come down to something which is an n wave first order, or we can retain our second order. And if we retain our second order, we go away by, we find our eigenvectors and eigenvalues associated with our coupled equations as follows. And we can go away then and match across the boundaries, match the E fields and the H fields across the boundaries by expressing our field inside and our field outside. Very much as we do, for example, just doing something simple like a very parochial cavity. And again, we go away and solve this. We have multiple simultaneous equations, multiple unknowns. As long as we've got enough simultaneous equations, we can find out what's happening inside. We can extract out information for the diffraction efficiencies. It's numerically intensive. There are many other ways to do this, but you can buy software packages now that will do this for you. And I know people, for example, in the States who have uh, classes and they give them assignments like use MATLAB to go away and find and solve these types of problems. Okay, so I've said to you, you want to make things. You want to basically characterize, you want to improve materials. The materials are really, really critical. What do we do about materials? Now, the material I spend, I said I've worked with dichromated gelatin and silver halide. And I've worked with a couple of other different types of materials, PQ, PMMA, et cetera. Most of the time I've worked with polyvinyl alcohol, which is a free radical type material. And it's cell processing. And cell processing means you don't have to go into a dark room. There are, there are now good commercial materials as well available that you can buy and, and decent providers. Okay. So what are we doing? We're talking about experimentally characterizing material and using a material. So how much does the diffraction efficiency vary with exposure? Before we were saying we've got an interference pattern, we multiply it by a constant, that tells us our grating. And then we go away and we use electromagnetic theory to find out how much light is scattered by that particular element that you've made. But there's a big gap, as you can imagine, between the nice ideal theory and what actually happens in practice. What does a growth curve look like? We've got this sinusoidal variation of the diffraction efficiency, which is a function of the grating modulation. I mentioned already that modulation may be a function of the depth. Different materials, you will have different responses. You'll have materials with different sensitivity. The modulation will grow by different amounts given exposure to particular wavelengths. And if you change the period of the interference pattern, the amount it grows will also vary. So it's not just a function of the amount of light you put in. It's also fundamentally a function of the reactions that are taking place inside of the material. The sinusoid, you also saw sinusoid vary periodically. If you expose for longer and longer, the modulation gets bigger and bigger. You can go all the way up to 100% and come all the way down to zero and go all the way back up to 100. In practice, you're going to run out the dynamical range of the material. You're going to run out of active material. Eventually, it's going to saturate. You get things like shrinking and swelling. Even if you don't chemically process, the fact that you're converting some type of material into some other type of material can lead to shrinkage and swelling effects. How do you deal with things like that? And what happens off brag? What information can you extract from off brag measurement? You might say, well, I want to make it for off on brag use, and I'm only going to use it on brag. So why should I be worried about off brag? Well, it turns out off brag is very good in finding out what's actually happening inside the material. And often shrinking and swelling or things that happen in the material will cause the replay conditions to change. So how does the fraction of energy change the period, the spatial frequency of exposing pattern change? And again, this is a very engineering way to talk about things. What is the spatial frequency response to the material? And can we make that better? Because that's going to be very critical. The smaller the thing I can make, in other words, the higher the, the uh, sensitivity or the higher the response characteristic of the material, the better the material is going to be for things like holographic data storage. So on the left here, I'm showing sort of things that look relatively ideal. So that would be a refractive index increasing as a function of time and amplitude, and that would be the resulting diffraction efficiency. But we've got a saturation type effect, even though it's quite ideal, we have a saturation effect. The modulation does not increase at the same rate for every time interval, okay? It varies with time, it slows down with time. And on the, uh, on the right there, I've actually got some experimental type growth curves that you actually see and also the effects of shrinking and swelling, which you can measure. And you can see there the side lobe structure there in the bottom right-hand corner is not uniform. It's, it's, it's not a symmetric sync function. It has distortions, and that's due to non-uniformity during the actual uh, recording. And the shifting is due to some sort of shrinking or swelling type effect in the material. You can go away and you can get better materials, and you can increase 
the range, you can increase the range of sexual ability. So you can mean, so you can start off and say, well, okay, here's my growth curve. Here's an off brag and the off brag curve there in the middle is very uniform, very symmetric, which means that the grating would appear to be very uniform at depth. And then on the top right hand, you've got a case of overmodulation. It doesn't quite go down to zero, but you can see you've gone all the way up. You've come down again and you've gone all the way back up again. So the modulation has increased over quite a large range. But you notice the time axis there is very, very long. You've got a very long time axis. However, it turns out that you can go away and you can com compare the responses of very various materials with one another. So there's a commercial material or a precursor to a commercial material in blue. And there's our homemade, home-baked material there in red. And you can see there that you've got this spatial frequency on the bottom axis is the spatial frequency. So one of that will be associated with the period of the interference pattern. And you can see that as you increase the spatial frequency, both for very low spatial frequencies and very high spatial frequencies, so for very big periods and very small periods, the response to the material drops off. You don't get the same bang for your book. You're putting in the same amount of light, but you're not making the same amount of grating. And one of the questions is, how does that happen? Why does it happen? And it turns out it happens for a variety of reasons, and typically these reasons depend on the material you're using for doing your recording. One of the things we've looked at is the idea of this a non-local material. So the idea that we've got these two red beams coming in here that are recording, and then we've got a green beam, which is the probe beam. So the material doesn't react. It doesn't chemically react to the green beam. So by measuring the diffraction of the green beam, we can actually figure out what's happening inside that layer when we're exposing with the red beam. And what's simply happening is that we have a monomer dye, which absorbs the light, and it's going to absorb most light where it's brightly illuminated. And that is going to start a polymerization process. So we talk about a chain initiation, and then we've got a chain growth or propagation, and then finally a chain termination. And as this polymer is being formed, it's being formed by, by adding to a particular monomer. And what we're doing is we're setting up a gradient inside that layer. In the dark regions, there's lots of monomer and no polymer. And in the bright regions, there's polymer and there's less monomer. And typically, the polymer will also take up, for example, less space than the monomer. So you also have some sort of a shrinkage effect. We note this is non-local, and it's non-local in space and non-local in time. If we switch the light off, the process will continue. The chains will keep growing. They'll keep removing monomer. So it keeps going after you switch the exposing beam off. But also, we see that we're removing monomer at some distance from the point where we start using monomer, where we start the chain growing. So we have some spreading out or smearing of the effects of the exposing pattern. So here now is a flow chart. Uh, this uh, John, is John uh, I would like yes. to, to advise you that you have you are one hour speaker speaking. Okay, okay. okay. I think maybe I can I can finish in five minutes. <laughs> okay, thank you very okay. much. I think so. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm just going to say this is a flow chart, and we've tried to initiate. There's initiation there in red, propagation and inhibition, termination. Uh, every part of this is governed by some chemical reaction, and every part of it is associated with some rate equations. There's similar types of process, for example, if you've got dyes exciting some sort of reaction, even like, for example, solar cells. You've got chemical descriptions, equations describing what's happening when the uh, rates of reactions, and sometimes this just involves excitations of particular molecules and governing differential equations for those cases. And then if you take the entire flow chart, you end up with a set of equations like this. Now, this looks pretty horrible, but most people who've dealt with Copernic are used to for first order differential equations. And I must be emphasized that all of the things in the square brackets are concentrations. So while it's in Koblenz's case, you've got variables which are complex. The R and the S, for example, are complex valued. Or in the rigorous theory, you've got an S which is complex valued, has an amplitude and a phase. All of these things are real positive valued, essential. They may be negative valued, but they're certainly real valued. And they're all based as well at using Fourier series expansion in mind with the Koblenz type description. There are other types of materials besides these free radical materials. One would be PQ, PMMA. In this case, you've got a very different type of material process involved, but you can go away, you can write down your flow charts and your, your chemical equations, and you can come up with your rate equations, and many of the same types of process and ideas apply, okay? The PQ and PMMA is very interesting for people because it has a very high uh, glass transition temperature. So, for example, people use it for things like solar concentrators in some cases.
Now, why are these models, what engineering type insights do these types of discussions give you? Well, one thing, for example, is people talk about the scaling law for holographic data stores. Essentially, you want to record a lot of gradients with the same diffraction efficiency, and you want each page to diffract the same amount of light if they're illuminated or played on brag. And people say if you've got a fixed layer and you try to do this, then basically the diffraction efficiency you can get from each grating is going to go down as one over the number of gratings, the number of pages you record squared. And you can go away and you can use your diffraction theory to provide a basis for this. And you can use your material model to provide an explanation of which parameters inside the material are actually putting the limitations on that. So in other words, you can go away and you can try and design or understand what happens inside the layer. Uh, using these types of ideas. It is that with the holographic data storage is you want to come up with a schedule. So you want to say, well, okay, I have a certain exposure intensity. It's going to, I've got to put in a certain amount of intensity for a certain amount of time to achieve a certain diffraction efficiency. So again, I want to have these things equal. But we've seen already that these, this response to the material, the growth curves are not linear. Typically, the longer you expose, yeah, the longer the exposure time, the more dose you've got to put in to achieve the same amount of modulation. So again, using these types of models, you can come up with a way to produce M gratings or M pages, which have equal refractive index and therefore produce equal amounts of diffraction efficiency. So this is a very systems or engineering approach that the model is developed, the material model is developed, the scaling model is developed, and then it's used and applied to come up with answers and solutions. So very nicely, I think. It's not, I, I was afraid I'd be here for three or four hours. I, I was telling uh, uh, in the Macalada that sometimes I'm accused by my students of being like Fidel Castro, that I like to give six and seven hour speeches. But thankfully, it's worked out fairly well. But what I wanted to emphasize to you guys is that in a very superficial way, that an awful lot of what I've been doing for the last 20, 30 years have all come from the work done by these guys, inspired by these guys. And although it's very much applied work, and there's a huge amount of applied work to be done using the holographic principle and ideas from holography. And although it seems to be unconnected, so people doing metrology, people doing encryption, yeah, people fabricating arrays of lenses for shuffle networks, all of it at the end of the day, all of it comes back down to this idea of being able to characterize materials, of using the holographic principle, using it to characterize materials, using it to fabricate components, devices, using it to encode information for storage or art, and to decode that information in order to extract out information from the system. So I end here with two points. The first is thank you, Dennis Gabor. <laughs> yeah, you, he's kept me busy and out of trouble for many, many years, and that alone he deserves praise for, okay? The other thing is, again, I want to emphasize, there are going to be a lot of special issues. There are going to be a lot of special sections and conferences, not just dealing with the history, but the technology, what's happening now, the ideas that people are developing now, the materials they're developing, the digital holographic systems they're building, the applications of these things to measure things, okay? I strongly recommend you go and put something together, urge your colleagues to do so, partly because it would be nice to have a celebration. I think it's not being very nice for the last year. In some of your countries, I'm sure it's really bad now. In Ireland, we've been through three waves of this. I think we deserve to have a party, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I think we deserve to have a very nice party. And I can think of no better reason to celebrate than to celebrate the works of Gabor and the work of Denisouk and the work of Leith and Uputnik. Okay, so thank you very much for listening to me.